Hi, everyone. I'm Heather Paduska, star maker for entrepreneurs who want to unlock their potential, command any stage, and make blockbuster profits. Welcome to Thrive, the show where I bring you tips, resources, and people to help you create a brand that makes you happy and profitable. Here we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Heather Paduska, and welcome to this episode of Thrive, the art of business with my guest, Dela Arabella. Dela Arabella is a media strategist, a certified meeting professional, and the co-founder of the Boston Women in Media and Entertainment Organization. On this episode, Dela shares with us what it really takes to create a successful career as a performer. She talks to us about why it's so important to build relationships and partnerships, and she gives specific strategies that both artists and entrepreneurs can use to create powerful networks. Dela also talks to us about why it's important to understand your target audience and to know when to reinvent yourself to stay relevant. And finally, she shares with us the number one word you need to have in your vocabulary to get your foot in the door and take advantage of every opportunity. Dela is a wealth of knowledge and she's so generous with her expertise. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, I'm Heather Paduska and welcome to Thrive, the show where I bring you tips, resources, and people to help you create a more abundant business and life. You are in for 30 minutes of high value content coming to you from industry leaders who are growing their business, making an impact, and rocking their brands. And I am thrilled to have my guest here today, Dela Arabella. Dela is a national award-winning media strategist, event architect, and certified meeting professional whose clients can be found in any business sector from high tech to healthcare and high, higher education to the arts. Dela built her own company, Dela Arabella Inc., on her reputation as a fearless out-of-the-box thinker, forming powerful and long-lasting partnerships along the way. Her dedication to the power of connections led her to co-found the Boston Women in Media and Entertainment Organization in 2012 with the beloved Boston broadcaster, Candy O'Terry. Now over 200 members strong, the mission of the organization is to connect, inspire, and educate women in the media and the arts. Dela is also the winner of the National Biz Bash Award for Best Trade Show and is a Bell winner for the Best Local Programming from the Alliance of Women in Media. Thank you so much for being here, Dela. Thanks, Heather. And thanks for that introduction. Yeah, well, it's all you, baby. It's all you. So it's great. Um, so tell us a little bit. I love that you have on your um, bio and your resume that you're an event architect. What does it mean to be an event architect? It's building. It's about really listening to your clients and building something new and building something that lasts. I think a lot of people are moving away from that one-shot event but building something that can grow for their mission and for their needs. So, you know, if you're more of an architect, you're putting something together that's part of their legacy and not just something that's over in a few months. That's awesome. And do you find that people are still embracing live events now that we have so much on social media and online? Are live events still hot and still doing what, what they should be doing to ignite your audience? It is. In fact, the event business is a billion dollar business that's growing and it yeah. seems like it would fly in in the face of everything that we're doing electronically but i think that power of personal connection still is the big winner yeah i agree there's nothing i mean i love these platforms where we can see each other face to face and hear each other's voices but there's nothing like personal connections and you're way more likely to buy from somebody you've met in person or to work with someone or to collaborate with someone that you've met in person because you get so much more information about that human entity across from you when you're face to face in a room. Absolutely. I think that's where the really big opportunities lie for people, regardless of what industry that you're in. Yeah. So you have a vast, um, diversity and who you work with. You work with higher education. How did you forge all those different kinds of relationships? Because I know a lot of people really niche themselves in one way, but you've been able to make something really expansive and touch a lot of different areas. I think when I started out, I it, it goes to a BWME as well. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, I wanted whatever my business plan was to have a firm found foundation, but to also make sure that, um, that 
that it grew organically to mm. where it should be and not I dictate I really want to be in high tech and I really want to be in the arts so I want I just let it kind of simmer and see what worked and what kind of relationships I built yeah, so we keep talking about relationships, and that's something that you're really passionate about. How did you how did you know early on that relationships were so important? Was there some event in your life or your business life where the light went off and you were like, "Man, this is this is it." I'm going to pull out this when I talk to you, just because it's a big, big uh, echo. Is that okay? Uh, okay. You can yeah, absolutely. That, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, when I first started uh, my business. I started while I was still, I had a full-time job with Hilton. It was a great experience and things just kind of kept coming to me. You know, I, I, I was uh, working really hard. I was uh, producing events for Hilton in Boston and many people were coming up to me and saying, Hey, could you produce these kinds of events, you know, for me? And I was also the media strategist for Hilton in Boston. And they said the same thing. Could you do this work for me on these private things? And with Hilton's okay, I started doing some freelancing. And mm -hmm. I learned that without that pedigree, I went to pre-law, never went to event planning, you know, school, <laughs> hospitality school. I was going to be a lawyer without and that kind of education or even those kinds of connections because I didn't spend my time in that space early on. All these things were happening because I was doing things and I let that mm -hmm. experience be the roadmap that kind of led me to the next next thing. So those relationships I built ended up being much more, much more important than the, the experience, the, the, the schoolwork, or even a, a, a big portfolio early days. Yeah, I think that, you know, experience is key. I mean, not experience, interaction is key. And, and experience, actually, experience is key, too. It's, it's more important than just having the education behind you, but that real-life experience and making those connections, absolutely. And now you use those connections to help other women build their network. So talk to us a little bit about what you're doing now with Boston Women Media and Entertainment because it's such a lovely organization. I'm a member. You're the co-founder with Candy O'Terry and it really is quite a gift to the city of Boston. And I would love for you to chat more about that and, and what the mission is and, and in relationship to that whole relationship building. Sure. Uh, we started in 2012, so we're still in our infancy in a way. Uh, we founded it in uh, by Candy O'Terry and myself, as you know, is a well-known Boston broadcaster. It was uh, a conversation we had the previous year in Thanksgiving, and we were talking about connections and how both of us, you know, have leveraged our own networks and tried to help as many people as we could along the way. And the interesting questions we'd always get, like, how did you, you know, how did you get there, or how did you get that client, or how did you do this? And for me, for the most part. Every time it was a part, it was something that a relationship that I had that existed that I leveraged in a way. I realized one, my network wasn't as large as it should be, and I realized how many other people in our business, be it arts or entertainment, needed help building those networks. We're not born with these big networks. Some people are, mm -hmm. very few. And mm -hmm. I think we realized there was a need. So we started BWME, kind of a threefold mission. One was to connect women, to build connections, to inspire them, and to educate them. As you know, Heather, women in our industry, whether it's media, uh, behind the scenes, or, or, or in front of the camera, same thing with entertainment. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. And they, they, we have a shelf life that's considered relatively short. And now reinventing yourself, which is such a fun thing to say, um, is, is imperative. Is imperative. You could have five stages of your career. And right. I think that that part of learning and networking now never ends. It's not for millennials or 20 something. It's part of your practice. Yeah. And I think that you're always evolving. So where you were when you were, a well, you're always a millennial, but I guess when you were in your 20s and when your 30s shifts as you go along and it's important to constantly be filling your well with new people because you're you're evolving they're evolving and we're you might have had a contact 10 years ago that you haven't touched and you don't know where they're going to be in 10 years so it's important to keep that fresh all the time yeah i think one of the things about bwme that i love and that has really evolved i think it has taken shape much more so in the last year is our network of women, we're about 200 strong now. And as I mentioned, they work on air, 
uh, on the other side of the camera, they're entertainers, and they're everybody who, just to explain a little bit of who we are, they're yeah. everybody from entertainment lawyers and accountants and grips and, you know, camera women and sounds and lights and hair and makeup. I always joke, we could really take the show on the road. We got the whole <laughs> the pieces. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What I, what I lo love about it is that we are now a network um, in Boston that we're hiring each other. We mm. are working together. We're making those calls and saying, I have a project. Can you, you know, uh, you know, consult with me on something? Can I hire you? You know, this is happening all the time. I, uh, BWME members are my clients now and I'm clients of theirs. It's mm -hmm. really working and I love it. And it just goes to show you how much if we band together, we're all going to be better for it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And one of the things that I think is so cool is that business in general is getting more visual. It, you know, you cannot hide out in your, in your cube anymore. You really have to have a presence, whether that's an individual presence or a company presence. And it's more and more like video is exploding. And if you don't have a video presence online, you're really losing out on a huge market because there's YouTube, there's Snapchat, there's now there's live streaming from Facebook. People want to see your face and they want to hear your point of view. They want to hear your voice. So I think it's really an awesome opportunity for the people that are in um, um, Boston Women in Media because they have those skill sets. Now, they have the skill sets to be in front of the camera and their art. Talk to us a little bit about what pieces you see that, that demographic needing help with. You know, you're in front of the camera, you're a great personality, but you still have to put food on your table. You still have to grow your business. So what, what pieces are important for all entrepreneurs, but artistic entrepreneurs in particular to, to know more about? You know, I think one of the big changes in the last, maybe even, I was going to say 10 years, but even five years, is that you really have to evaluate your toolkit. You have mm -hmm. to be a doer. You no longer will have, you know, when you change over to being an entrepreneur, and maybe even sometimes if you're in a smaller company and you're used to a bigger, you know, a bigger infrastructure, you no longer have the admin. You no longer have the hair and makeup people. You no longer have the scheduler and the video guy and the go-to. So you have to build it yourself. Some of it you need to learn how to do. It's no longer like, well, I just have someone to do that. Even if you do, you really should learn a little bit about what you're doing, whether it's editing or copy editing or, you know, whatever you are doing. And from for just for me, for example, I used to always joke when I worked with Hilton, I can do anything in this building except run the soundboard. But 11 years of doing that, over 3,000 shows, things went wrong and everyone was looking at me. So what did I do? I, I could not probably run the Emmys, but I can certainly run a soundboard now. <laughs> those, are kinds, those are the kinds of things people, women of a certain age, probably my age, maybe a little bit older, are not used to taking all this into their own hands and realizing and owning the fact that all these things that were just horrible and you know not having to deal with, you have to deal with. And some of, uh, some of the biggest complaints I hear is, I just don't, still don't want to deal with technology. Well, it's not going anywhere. And if you're not going no, anywhere, not you better get used to it. That's right. And the thing that's really cool, I think, and really exciting is that technology has gotten so much easier easier. It's so much more accessible. The tools out there are user friendly and you could put a whole movie together with your iPhone. You know, I mean, it's just so much easier. And I think the other thing is that we're, it's, the world is niched. The world is getting more and more niched and you really have to become your own brand. You have to be your own business. And I think that it's it's a mistake not to think in that way. And what would you say to people who are maybe not, um, I was just talking to someone else about kismet, you know, like not kismet clients for Boston um, women in media and entertainment, but somebody who's more behind the scenes, who's not as comfortable being in the spotlight. What, what would you say to them about what's important to really to carve that successful path? Well, the spotlight is different for different people. If you are behind the scenes, and I generally consider myself behind the scenes, where is your spotlight? You still need to get in front of the right people. It may not mm -hmm. mean that you have to have your own video necessarily or even your own website, but you need to make sure that you take your share of the spotlight. You are in front mm -hmm. of the people that you can help and that you can solve problems for. 
So I think that's, so what, that's one of, one of the, the things that I think is the most important. Not everybody has to have this massive, um, you know, social media footprint or, or a website or this kind of infrastructure, but you have to own the space where you can be helpful to people, where they can find you. I think that's important. So what would be some practical things that people could do? So they, they need to be in front of their right audience of, you know, their target audience. It might not be a, an audience of customers, but your target audience might be your employers or your contractors or your JV partners. Yeah. How, what would be some practical things to tell them to get themselves more in front of their audience? What, what are some useful things, especially I think in terms of the collaboration and the partnership building that you were talking about before? Sure. I think this I think one of the things I find most interesting is when people um, go to trade shows, go to places where people who need your services are going, going to trade shows, going to um, conferences that people either like you or people who need your skills are. You might say, well, why would I go? I mean, I know this. Yes, but everyone there is looking for services like you. And as you know, mm -hmm. the Boston Women's Conference was just here. We had five BWME members there presented. Now, why? Because there are women there that need their mm. services. They put themselves in the right place. So I always think that's a good idea. Local networking, I'm always in favor of local networking, but also regional networking. It may cost you, you know, a couple of thousand dollars to get in the right place, but to see what your peers are doing in other places, it's important. You may say, well, why do I have to do that? I can just go online. You can't always do that online. And something magical just might happen when you put yourself in a room with a thousand people. It might spark your own uh, imagination. So I highly recommend that. People don't even look up trades anymore. Trade journals are a treasure trove of information of how to craft your message and how other people are crafting it. And that's to the specific market you may mm -hmm. be looking for. Yeah. And I always say, you know, people get out, they want to get out there, they want to start marketing, they want to use social media. But I always say message comes first. You have to have that message in place because you could do all the marketing in the world. But if you don't have a clear message, if you can't articulate your value or, or know your lane or talk to people about your lane, it's not going to, you're going to be spinning your wheels basically. But I love what you said about the, the conferencing and going to different places. So you're in the biz, you're doing a lot of events. What are some hot events, some hot conferences that someone who is, you know, trying to grow their business, trying to be, get the exposure for our industry of the arts and the media and all those things. What are some hot things? Also, I just came back from one the other day. Consider? It's the Association of Presenting Arts Promoters. It's APAP in New York City. It is a fantastic, and what you will see mm. there is people who are in our business in live arts. This is basically live arts only. Um, and it takes over all of Midtown mm -hmm. Manhattan where you have uh, everybody from mm. circus, circus acts to big, big, big stars will come into town and showcase their wares. Their agents are all there. All the big agencies um, come into town. It's very interesting. And I have, I mean, over the last 15 years, recommended many of the young artists from Boston and New York, from all over, but that's locally, to go to that conference. And they say, well, why am I going to go there? There's so much competition. I don't have an agent. Hunt. But you know what? See what people are doing. See how the showcases are going. Make connections. I've made so many connections mm -hmm. on the floor of that conference, not only for me, but for people I've invited. Let me invite you to come to meet some of these mm. um, bookers, you know, some of these venue owners. Everybody is there. People who run all kinds of performing arts centers, people who run mm. small clubs like I had done, people who run the big theaters, they're all there. And all the infrastructure there, all the publicists are there, all the bookers are there, all the people who run the festival circuit is there. So go, see what the conversations are like. It's, wow. it, and I'll tell you, it's the APAP conference. It just is always in January in New York City. I recommend this highly to any young or even quasi established artist to go down there because what you can do is uh, make sure, oh, did I lose you, Heather? I don't know what happened, I'm here. Okay, okay. Yeah. But what you can do on the floor is just to make sure, um, you know, see how you, how, how you are, where you are on the spectrum. You know, do you have all the stuff that people are asking for before you put yourself on the line? There's showcasing opportunities all over the city. 
usually what happens is the people I would invite down with me, they couldn't, they weren't able to showcase that year, mm -hmm. but next year they were completely prepared to do it. That's awesome. Those are the kinds of things, and that's just one of several conferences, but that's a biggie for our industry. Yeah. Totally recommend people going down there. So it's an it's a conference where people showcase their talent. Is that what it is? Are there shows and different performances? Everywhere from Madison Square Garden to SOBs to um, Carnegie Hall are doing showcases. Wow. So the agents will book those places and put all of their artists in there. Wow. So, I mean, there were days where, especially when I was a house booker, you'd go to 17, 20 showcases a day. Wow. There were 15 minute, you know, presentations, right. but it's not only for someone who is a performer, it's for someone who's a host, someone mm -hmm. who runs a venue, someone who's an event planner like me trying to see like, who, who's doing what, where, who yeah. has the exciting series? Yeah. You know, what are my friends doing like in San Francisco? You know, what are my peers in New York doing? Same thing. So it's, it's really, it's a presenting art. It's really for presenting performers and all the people it takes to put those shows on. That's so it's really the bookers, the, um, you know, all the talent agencies that are there. But if you're in our business, it's just very good. You see emerging trends. And I can't tell you enough. You know, my clients, uh, I have a good strain of clients who are classical music and jazz. They have great classes. I go to as many net, uh, workshops as I can in between. I mean, you don't sleep. It's literally like 22 hours a day. It's fabulous. The song. Can't record, and it's APAP, A P A P dash conference. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. There's still more great content to come, but I wanted to take just a minute to talk to you about a new course I've created called Close Any Room. You may have noticed that all of my guests know how to speak about their businesses in a clear and compelling way, but that's something a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, and it's something you need to know how to do so you can convert your audience into more sales, and that's why I've created this course. It's a six-week audio course to teach you how to craft a signature talk so that you can authentically give value and close more of your audience from the stage. In the class, you learn how to create a clear and compelling point of view, how to organize your content and give great value to your audience without giving away the farm, how to structure your talk so that it seamlessly closes your audience at the end without feeling salesy, and I also give you templates and instructions how to create more marketing materials, a speaker sheet, and all kinds of sign-up sheets when you're giving your talks. And finally, what everybody's hot to know, I also give you tips and resources on how to find speaking gigs. It's an all-inclusive course so that you can start closing and selling more from the stage. And as my free gift to you for tuning into the podcast, I'm giving you my free webinar, also called Close Any Room, and you can listen to it at clearvoicebranding.com forward slash close dash any dash room. And it will give you lots of tips and information to get you started on how to create that signature talk that sells. Okay, we're going to get back to the show now. There's still more great content to come. Thanks for joining me. I'll put it in the chat. I hope I did that right. right. I'm going to put it in the chat. APAP dot conference. No, right. dash conference, you said, dot org. Dash conference. Conference dot org. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. It just ended on on Monday, but it's really never too early to get running, get rolling. Well, that's a great one. I love oh. that. I'm sorry. It's APAP nyc.org ah okay i'll i'll fix that okay a pap and i also see it apap365.org conference.org okay uh awesome so so my next question is you're down there you're a booker there are these people that are looking for for talent they want that next star to come through so what do you need? What do you need to see? What What is a star quality? How do you know if that's the one? What should these artists or performers or even you know for the business people who want to be you know the star in their industry? What are those qualities that you need to see? You know, it depends. If they're a new artist, you want to just get to know and see who they are, who their following is. Are they going to fit your clients? 
you know, your clientele, depending. I do a lot of private events, so I'm not so much concerned with the public or my audience. Well, I am my audience, but it's different. Um, but for the most part, the people that have, you know, a theater or performing arts center, they're thinking about their demographic and how it works. Mm -hmm. So you generally, as a new performer, you want to be you, but you want to make sure it's accessible to the kind of widest audience that you can. Now, there's an interesting thing that also happens, and this speaks to what we were speaking about earlier, is that it's not all for young people because there's older, more mature artists out there who have a reputation, which maybe they don't, they want to lose or they yeah. are changing niches, you know? And so instead of being, oh yeah, they're crooner and boring and my, my audience is more hip, they're really not it. And it happened to me. I don't know if we want to spend too much time on this, but I think it speaks to, you know, women especially of all different ages and how you have to really be on your game because you're always selling yourself at every stage. I went down looking for a client and they had said, oh, you know, we're looking for, uh, you know, someone who, you know, like old R&B that's been around but still hip and has it. And I looked down the sheet that I have, you know, just had all the and it showed Jennifer Holland. And I'm like, oh, you know, I heard, you know, I heard, you know, on the street you hear stuff. I'm like, eh, I don't know. It doesn't, you know, so I just kind of crossed it off the list because I already thought it's too much to see. I'm not going to waste time on what I kind of know that's just not going to work. Lo and behold, and this happens at APAP, you turn a corner and she's performing like a cappella in a hallway. <sighs> it blew my, to the, now that was three years ago at APAP, people still talk about this. It wow. blew your mind out. I was like, oh, and I went up to her after and just gave her a big hug. I'm like, that was amazing. And we booked her and we've been friends ever since. Um, and she blew us all away in Boston when she came up to the Westin for my private event. She was unbelievable. But it just goes to show you, she knew that she needed to get out there because pe she knew she had kind of this preconception of her and she w wanted to lose it. She's not old. She's still with it. She can still command an audience. You know, mm -hmm. she's vivacious and wonderful and had a one set of pipes that wouldn't quit. So that's why I think it's important that no matter where you are in your you have to not only get out there, but you still have to prove yourself. Yeah, I love that. And I, you know, she's in a hallway. So you, I love it. You just have to get out there. And it doesn't matter if you're a musician or a business person. I think that that's it, that there's so many times you're like, oh, I don't know if people are going to like me or this isn't the right place or the right time. But you just never know when you put that energy out there. Like you, like, I love that you said it so beautifully. Who is going to walk around the corner? I mean, literally or figuratively, who is going to see your talent? You never know who's going to be in need of what you have to do. And then the other thing, I mean, as you're talking, the person that keeps popping to mind for me is Tony Bennett. I mean, you know, he's reinvented himself. He's got Lady Gaga singing with him. And he's still, I mean, I listen to his Christmas album every Christmas. I, I love it. It's awesome. So sometimes I think it's just, you don't have to completely do it 180 with who you are or what your talent is. But you know, stay relevant and get yourself out there. And I think for women too, is not to allow yourself to be shamed about getting older, right? That it's just, I think some of it is a mindset that, you know, why should I feel badly because I'm getting older? I still have this to give and that's not, I'm just not going to buy into that. And it, you might not be selling to a 20 year old crowd, but it doesn't mean that you aren't relevant just because you have a different number behind your name. So I'm a, big, I'm a big believer of making your own opportunities. Oh, and I, and I agree with that 100%. In fact, you know, in this kind of fever to reinvent yourself and to make sure you look, you know, appealing to all markets and to different generations, I always think of, I think it was Rita Hayworth said this once, you still have to wake up, be able to wake up with yourself in the morning. Mm. Because people will feel if it's not authentic, if this is yes. really a big you know, ploy to get, you know, into the millennial market or to get in a certain market. You're not like, I work with uh, several high tech and I am not a high techie. I'm not a dad. I mean, I, I have all the things you need to be in this business, but I'm not. And I remember when I did the events and I thought, Oh, I'm never going to get this bid because, you know, they're going to want some, you know, little gizmo and somebody who's all this. But I was like, you know what, we'll, we'll, we'll go on this journey together. It worked. They loved my presentation, but I was still me. You know, it was yes. still something that was really authentic to my vision and to how I thought I could help them. Right. Uh, 
Yes. And I think that that's, you know, if authenticity is very attractive and if it's not, then it's not meant to be, it's not your audience. It's maybe you're not the right person. And, and it's goes both ways. You're shopping both ways, right? It's not just, please take me, please take me, please take me. It's like, I, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's the audience that's calling me. That's, that's an excellent point because the other thing with being authentic is having true energy. I am the energizer bunny. Everybody yeah. who knows me will tell you. I still, I always joke with, with my partner in, in life is that we, I, he's like, I cannot, he didn't know me in my twenties. He goes, I can't imagine what that was like. I said, it's the same. That hasn't changed. But I, I really do refuse to take certain things. There, it hasn't been a lot, but there's been a few cases where I just passed mm -hmm. on, on things because I thought, you know what? This is, I'm not going to do anybody justice. I'm not, it's not going to work. We're not a good pairing or I, uh, it was like a money grab where, yeah. okay, I'll take the money, but this is going to be one hell of a, you know, nine months. You know, I, I understand that people have to do that. And I, ha it, I will not say that I've never done that, mm -hmm. but it really, um, I don't think you can do your best work when you don't, you're not enthused about something and that you have high, you know, high energy level and that you don't have that kind of level of excitement to get through the tough stuff that happens that we all have to deal with yeah. uh, in our respective areas. So I always say, just think about that too. I mean, we all want to be successful and grab as much as we can, but being authentic and being energized and having that energy that's infectious and people like, I just like being around her. Mm -hmm. that, that, That'll get you in the door many, many times. Well, and I was um, was it was it talking to you or to Candy about yes and yes is the right answer, <laughs> right? Like when I'm a big say yes sir. Yes, and I always say I wouldn't have had any of this if I didn't early days just say yes to things. I would say yes, and this is when I'm still at Hilton, and people kept saying, you know, when I first got to Hilton, and I they said, you know, do you know how to run a jazz club? I was like, no, I was like 22. They're like, do you want to try? I'm like. Sure. Went home. I was like sick to my stomach. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. You know, and then at one point we had to, uh, we had to really evaluate, you know, the, the contractors that they had. And I was unhappy with the PR and in, in the way that was being handled. So now it, it helps to be young because you really don't know what you're doing half the time. And if I was older, I might have had a little pause before I, I stepped there. But I said, you know what? I think we're going to save the money. And I'm just going to do it myself. How hard can it be? But <laughs> I'm so glad, you know, 10 years later, I have my own PR firm. Right. I never knew anything about PR until I made that decision where I think I'm going to learn it myself and I'm going to take it in house. And it was, it was successful. Yeah. I love that. You say yes and you learn, you say yes and you learn and you say yes and you learn. So and then you have to do your job and really learn and, and because you're, you're telling everybody you can do it and to trust you, they do. And then you have to work your butt off to make sure you don't let people down. That's one thing I can't tell people enough. You can talk the talk, but you've got to back it up because that only lasts so long if you don't. Yeah, and, but I think that what you're saying is a really good point because if you're a person of integrity, if you say yes, you are going to rise to the challenge. It might not be perfect, but you're going to do 120% to try to make that happen. Whereas if you're not sure that, and it doesn't energize you as much. If you are committed, if you have made the commitment and you are person integrity, you are going to put your shoulders a grindstone and try to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really true. So now that we have um, this organization that's so wonderful, what are some ways that um, Boston Women in Media Entertainment is helping its members Besides just the collaboration, I know that you've talked about some other perks and benefits of being a member. So what are some of those things to really help them grow? Sure. Well, we have great networking events that we do. We do about 80 a year, probably more, but that's basically that's the, the, the uh, initial footprint. And so the networking is great. We also, if you are a member of BWME, you're also a member of the Arts and Business Council. You're, it's mm -hmm. automatically, it's a reciprocal relationship that we have with them. There are hundreds, so that gives you free access to hundreds of, um, of uh, webinars that are directly to our industry, and they mm. are excellent. These are things that people pay $65 to $150 to, to be able to take part in, and they're all free. And I can tell you, I've done a few myself that are excellent. We also, mm. that, they are also part of the Volunteer Lawyers Association. So many mm -hmm. times the women in our group need some kind of legal help. 
you know, you get expedited care. In some cases, they get free help by mm. being a BHA member. And I can't tell you how many of our members have, with new businesses or their own nonprofits, have utilized that service. The other thing, and I think this is this is where BWME is is a hair different because there's a lot of organizations helping women and doing a good job in this mm -hmm. town, but we're less about events and more about kind of that one on one. And I think, and in fact, we're just de we're working on this right now because we don't do a very good job on testimonials, mainly because it's just getting done. And we're like, ah, eh, you know, people know, people don't know, and you have to let them know is how much one-on-one -on -one time that we take with our members, and that's Candy and I. And we mm -hmm. do that, in fact, next week we're doing it, where we physically get on the phone and call everybody and do right. a little bit of like, hey, where are you, what's going on, how can we help, and then put them in contact with people who can meet those needs. Now, I don't know if they can do anything, but at least it's a conversation starter. And they, whether it's they need help with their business, or they need help with their, uh, you know, their uh, you know professional appearance or they need headshots or they need a sound and light person or they need a new video they need copy editing a new bio um, they're trying to work with a certain client and they need an inroad and they need just a connection mm -hmm. so I think those are some of the things in fact and I'll give you a metric that's that uh, they can, in the first three years of our existence we assisted uh, we facilitated contracts with our members it, from five hundred dollars to sixty three thousand dollars. That's for a seventy five dollar wow. annual membership. So we wow. don't take a piece of that or anything. It's mainly we facilitate those connections, and if we can massage them as they go on, we certainly do. We have a great active board, and they do a lot of the the, the grunt work as well. Where they, I will say, listen, I I just talked to a member. Um, can you help them or can you at least point me in the right direction? So we are, you, you are have access to all of our networks and we try to help wherever we can. It's amazing. I mean, it's an incredible resource and you and Candy are just so generous with your time and your resources and, and your expertise to share that. I mean, it's really, really a gift and an amazing opportunity for people in the industry. So if they want to find out more about you or get, get membership, where do they go? BWME.org. That's easy enough. You click That's on, easy enough. Contact us. You'll see my picture or Candy's picture. Just email us and we will uh, get right back to you. Awesome. So two, two last questions. What would be one or two tips that you would give both um, artists and entrepreneurs, both sides of it? What would be the, like, the most important things that they need to do to grow their network now? To get out there is a big one, is to really be strategic about where you go. I'm hearing so many people over the last couple of years saying they have um, networking fatigue, but that's probably because mm -hmm. they're going to the wrong ones. So do your research and and go to the right mm -hmm. places. Secondly, and what should oh, go ahead? Go okay. ahead. And then secondly, I think get an honest, spend some money, get an honest evaluation. Um, of where you are from people that you mm. trust that is invaluable and so many of us were working so hard that we, we don't want to even take the time to do that mm -hmm. because without doing that you are going to the wrong networking events you're going you're sending your resume or you're sending bids to the wrong people so look mm. at your foundation of your business or your brand and make sure you are who you think you are, or you are who you're presenting. You know, you are who you're presenting. And I think that's a big problem. Right. I see so many people focused the wrong place. And I've had that happen mm. to me where I just got off track. So give me, an, give us an example of that. So you, like, what would it look like if I thought that I was one thing and I'm going to these networking events or I'm sending my resume to this place or I'm trying to make this contact? What does that look like when there's that disconnect of what you're projecting, what you think you are, who you're trying to reach? Okay. What so does that look like? I'll, I'll give you a – I'll use myself as an example. As I'll do my event planning side. I was going to a variety of networking events for event planners, and they're lovely people, many of which are my friends, and we're talking about – you know, stuff that happens to event planners, how, you know, problems with clients, getting clients, all this stuff. 
that's not really what I do. I don't send out bids. I don't do that. I work, and as I just mentioned and told everybody, is that I work on a relationship basis. I work mm -hmm. in a place where I have to feel authentic and energized. Going to those networking events are neither. They just aren't. However, mm -hmm. I have a lot of uh, uh, issues, a lot of personal and, and social issues that I feel very strongly about. So what I decided mm -hmm. to do was start going to networking events where people cared about those issues. And sure enough, mm. I started meeting executive directors, like marketing people, and all kinds of folks who had needs. They had we had we had similar values and they mm. needed that. I love that. We needed to raise money. And voila, I was the only event person in the room with my audience and it was in an authentic way because i really did care about one about was child obesity the other one was health care two things that are very important to me and i found myself in the right place working with the right clients and having very little competition in the room and here i was going to all these That's events awesome. with all these event planners and i was looking in the wrong direction wasting my time at the wrong kind of networks being in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, who you network with is not necessarily, you have your, your colleagues that you exchange ideas with, but they're not your clients, right? And your, your colleagues are not. All the time, though. PR people, yeah. hang out with PR people. And, 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 mm -hmm. and that's probably the second thing I would uh, mention to your, to your question before. Who is your network? You know, is it all... Mm one group of people is it people that you know that you can learn from or is it just people where you're just having the same drink in the same bar talking about the same things mm -hmm. you know it's um we're all still there where it's a little you know intimidating to go in new environments with sometimes much younger or much older people than yourself who have skill sets that are far advanced than your own but those are the ones you should be going to that's right. And if you're the smartest person in the room at every event that you go to, that you're not growing. Right? <laughs> yes. And they say, you know, you are your, how do they say it? Your growth, where you are, is based on the five people you hang out with the most, right? So if they're not at least of the same mindset, and at least having big dreams and big goals, in that way, it's not going to propel you forward. It doesn't mean that you have to have exactly the same education or experience, but you have to be of the same mindset where, you know, if you think you're saying, I want to be at Carnegie Hall and the person next to you is saying, you know, I want, <laughs> I want to go bowling, then it's not really, it's not a, or not, not a right match. BWME actually, I think that started because Candy and I realized together, we were friends for a long time and certainly worked with each other, but we have, very complementary skill sets mm -hmm. very much so we have very little overlap a little bit more now after being together and learning from each other all these years but uh, i think that's why we knew we had something because we mm. really are different ends of the spectrum in every way yeah so that's a you, well, you guys make a wonderful partnership and i'm so grateful that you um have formed this beautiful organization to help women and entertainers. And one other question, just before we I jump to the end, is that if someone wanted that kind of evaluation, is that something that you provide people? Can can up and coming artists come to you and say, I don't know where I fit in? Absolutely. Is that something you provide? People do okay. all the time. And if it's something that, if a member comes to me and they are really not someone I feel like I can evaluate fairly, it's just out of my own, um, skill level, we'll find somebody, you know, we'll find mm. someone for them to talk to. We have, we have 200 plus members now. So with the varying, um, you know, levels of expertise in uh, areas of expertise. So absolutely. And it's important. Okay. I think that's no matter where you are to do that regularly. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up with that because you mentioned it and I thought, I wonder if people are saying, well, how do I find that? How do I find someone to give me that honest feedback? So that's really great. Uh, right before it was like Christmas Eve, someone called me in the morning and they weren't <laughs> expecting to get, to get me. And I picked up the phone and they're like, oh, and I said, what's the matter? And they said, we just joined online. Can you, you know, I just wanted to see if I should have, maybe I shouldn't have. So we had this like half hour conversation. I was in the parking lot of Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> I it was love a that. Conversation and uh, we're excited to work with her in the new year. 
Oh, well, that's lovely. And you're so generous with your time. I really, really appreciate it. And I always ask all of my guests this question at the end. You know, we live in such an abundant world in Boston, in the United States. And in this moment, as we're just sitting here sharing this space in this time, uh, Dela, what are you most grateful for? Oh, boy, so much. My health. I always joke about I'm the Energizer Bunny. And I realize I never take that for granted. I always said, uh, uh, I always say, I only pray for health. Everything else I promised God I'd take care of myself. So uh, oh. that's, I'm very grateful for that. And my family's healthy and happy and can't get any better than that. I, I love that. I mean, that's so, I love that you said that, but also that you would take care of everything else. That just so wraps up who you, <laughs> but that wraps up who you are. I mean, so generous and kind, and I'm grateful for you and for all that you've done for the artists in this city. I mean, oh, it's really, it, it's so vulnerable to be an artist. It really is. It's hard and you put yourself out there and to have an organization and people like you and Candy that are there to support and guide and mentor and facilitate is just phenomenal. So thank you so much for all you do and, and for all of the charity work. And for sharing your skills and all everything that you bring to the table. And we appreciate it. We're looking forward to working with you in 2016. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Me as well. So I really thank you for your time and thank you everybody for joining us and always for my guests that come, I offer my free webinar so you can learn how to make profits while you speak from the stage. And you can get that at clearvoicebranding.com forward slash close dash any dash room. So thank you, Dela. I so appreciate you, you coming and being on the show. You got it. Thanks for having me. Okay. Take care. Thank right, you. Good. Take care. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Thrive. I loved having you here. I love having you as part of my community. And if you're enjoying the show, I would love it if you share it with your friends on Twitter, on Facebook, or wherever they're hanging out. I also want to let you know you can leave me feedback or comments. I love hearing from you. Just post those at heatherpodoska.com. You can also leave suggestions for topics that you'd like to know more about, or if there's someone you'd really like to see on the show, let me know that as well. Okay, until next time, here's to hitting all your high notes. Take care. Bye-bye.